Mr. Chairman and distinguished members, thank you for inviting me to contribute to this important conversation. In my prior role as a tenured professor at the University of Pennsylvania, I founded an interdisciplinary research center focused on race and education, workplace settings, and our larger society. I relocated that center with me to the University of Southern California last summer. I've spoken about the center's studies and my independent research at hundreds of colleges and universities across the United States. Surely, not every person on campuses at which I've spoken found my ideas and research findings agreeable. Notwithstanding, I've never had a speaking invitation withdrawn or had any group publicly protest the speech I delivered. It is important to acknowledge, however, that university administrators absolutely reserve the right to rescind speaking invitations they extend to me or anyone else. As a matter of fact, they typically make this clear in contractual agreements. These contracts are between institutions and their invited guests. I see no need for congressional intervention. For at least three reasons, tuition-paying college students have the right to protest people who bring hateful and poisonous messages to their communities. First, it is their campus. They pay to be there. Students have to learn, and in many cases, live there long after controversial speakers have come and gone. Second, student activity fee money is often used to fund expensive speakers, including those whom conservative student groups invite. Most people feel they have a say in something their money helps to finance. College students who pay tuition and fees are entitled to oppose spending thousands of their dollars on inflammatory, divisive guest speakers. Third, and most importantly, college students have the constitutional right to protest. Their freedom of speech is just as valuable as the First Amendment rights of controversial speakers and people who support them. My PhD is in higher education. This has been my primary academic field of study for two decades. Having been elected by my peers to serve as national president of the Association for the Study of Higher Education, I feel a serious sense of responsibility to help preserve colleges and universities as marketplaces for contested ideas and sites of serious intellectual debate. I wholeheartedly agree that more speech, not less, advances the democratic purposes of American higher education. Sending millions of college-educated citizens into the workforce with little experience talking with people who disagree with them politically is a significant failure of our nation's post-secondary institutions. Many campus conflicts pertaining to speech are inescapably racialized. Race is almost always at the center. Yet, in conversations about free speech, rarely is race and racism ever named. My research shows that we send far too many college graduates into the workforce without a proper course of study on race, racism, and racial inequity. Leaders in most sectors of our economy have college degrees, and a disproportionately high number of them are white. White Americans comprise 94% of governors, 87% of the U.S. Senate, 76% of the U.S. House of Representatives, 80% of K-12 teachers, 73% of college faculty members, and 83% of college and university presidents. Given these demographics, post-secondary institutions act irresponsibly when we fail to create conditions that bring together whites and students of color to talk and learn across racial and political lines. This, as I see it, is a matter of institutional responsibility. According to the U.S. Department of Education, our country has 4,724 degree-granting post-secondary institutions. Shouting down and rescinding invitations from highly compensated guest speakers is an issue plaguing only a tiny fraction of that 4,724 colleges and universities. College student activists are often accused of attempting to suppress their professor's speech. In 2016, there were more than 1.4 million faculty members at U.S. colleges and universities, even if 10,000 professors, which is a hypothetically high number, experienced aggressive encounters, encounters with speech suppressors on campus, that would be just 0.7% of the total faculty members nationwide. 
Most colleges and universities, including my own, host dozens, sometimes hundreds of speakers each year who bring a wide range of perspectives to campus. The overwhelming majority of these speakers do not experience protests. But unlike the few who do, many of whom, by the way, are entertainers, not academicians, Unlike those, I would invite student protesters into a conversation with me about our ideological and factual disagreements. I would insist that those who support my viewpoints make space to respectfully listen to and talk with others who do not. It is not in entertainers' financial or celebrity interest to patiently engage disagreeable students in productive conversations across partisan and racial lines. Again, I believe that this is a challenge for college and university leaders. It is certainly not a matter for the Congress and the courts, in my opinion. I look forward to your questions.